So today's study, <clears throat> if you have noticed on the on our post, uh, the title I have titled it: "Are Christians Required to Obey the Ten Commandments?" And this study is on special request uh, from Mr. Sanjeev Rao. Uh, he has been studying this subject, and though we have discussed it a few times, I'm sure there will be, you know, questions that remain. And uh, talking about questions, uh, this particular topic, I'm sure you may also have some uh, doubts about this, and you know, what are Christians supposed to be doing today? So. I before I begin into the study, I want to say that we welcome your questions. Uh, last week it was uh, so nice for uh, Sachin and Praveen to address. I'm presuming a question that was submitted to them with regards to what we have come to call as the Lent season or Easter preparations. And uh, knowing our history, we have had a particular point of view. But over time, we have changed that point of view and questions will definitely come. And I must say, and I, uh, you know, uh, reiterate that we honor your questions. I mean, we want to encourage you to ask questions because that's the only way we learn. Uh, uh, you know, as a church, as a denomination, uh, we uh, value theological, spiritual learning. That is something that has stayed with our DNA, that we have engaged ourselves in Bible study and uh, reading it with a sense of sincerity. And so um, we have always felt the need for us to be biblically literate because there are many uh, Christians who unfortunately are not as literate, literate as they need to be. So... Uh, and even as we try to um, deal with these questions, even as we try to answer these questions, I must say that we try our very best to maintain intellectual honesty, to use a word that Franklin Poppins uses many, many a times. <laughs> we try our very best to be intellectually honest. What do I mean by saying that? Uh, the, the reason, uh, the, the, the meaning for that is that we try to find answers that are, uh, what do you say, uh, 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 faithful to the scriptures. We try our best to be close to the scriptures. Uh, now, that doesn't mean to say we have all the answers. We, through our reformation, through our historical journey as a denomination, we have always... Uh, you know, looked at these questions with a sense of honesty. And we don't want to believe something that is not biblical. And so uh, we always try our very best to be honest with our answers. And sometimes we don't have the answers. And when we don't have the answers, well, we might try to, you know, uh, try to be as close to the Bible as possible. Uh, and sometimes we just say we just don't know. We just have to wait for the answer. So that is uh, something that we, I would like you to keep in mind as you know we discuss these questions that keep coming from time to time. Now, one very important thing I would like to mention, even as we deal with these questions, and that is it's important for all of us to know that... Uh, Though we might try our best to answer, there could still be uh, differences in opinions, differences in understanding. There could still be di diversity in the way we might look at a particular subject, uh, a particular topic, and that is bound to happen. We all have different uh, you know, perspectives. We come from different backgrounds, and uh, our my understanding may not exactly match yours, right? Now, what I wanted to say was, 
we we must learn to respect those differences right now the differences as long as they are not core issues uh, we have certain core issues of our belief system our faith now there should be no division on in that or differences in that but on some peripheral issues as opposed to the core issues if there are some differences well uh, we can live with that. Uh, we don't have to be too concerned about that. As long as, and this is crucial uh, that I mentioned this, as long as we don't create division. Now, that is something that we know from the scriptures that uh, a divisive attitude or a divisive activity can be uh, you know, very destructive. And we know division is not from the Holy Spirit. We always talk about the unity of the Holy Spirit. So even though there are differences in our understanding, uh, we learn to respect one another and we learn to love one another. As long as, like I said, the core issues are not uh, a problem. For example, if we say that Jesus Christ is not divine, now that becomes an extremely core issue. We say he is 100% human, 100% uh, God or divine. Now there are they cannot be a question on that because if we question that our entire faith is no value then because that's a very uh, very important aspect of our belief system. Um, so as we try to deal with these questions, uh, we try our very best to remain as close to the Bible, intellectually honest, like I said. But there may still be some differences, and that's okay as long as they are not core. But whatever the denominational viewpoint, we as GCI, we would like to encourage our members to maintain the unity in the spirit. Uh, we do our best to remain united as a fellowship. We do not want to create division. Uh, so... Uh, Having said that, uh, I would like you know you to know, or rather, uh, I would like you to let me know if you're comfortable with that policy that the church has uh, put in place. Uh, though we welcome questions, but we try our very best to maintain a sense of oneness and unity, no matter what the topic. Of course, like I said, we don't uh, dispute the core issues. All right. Having said that, I felt I needed to say that because, you know, when we have questions like these, like I said, we welcome questions. There will always be some little bit of here and there. And, uh, you know, we don't match, you know, line upon line. <laughs> and uh, uh, But as long as we don't create divisions, that should be okay. Now, today's topic is another old controversy, right? It begins in the first century when Jesus Christ came onto the earth, taking on our flesh in the incarnation, uh, establishing the church. And one of the <coughs> things that was being discussed in the church is what are we supposed, how should we live? What are we supposed to obey? The Jews said you have to obey the Mosaic commandments. Uh, the Gentiles found it difficult. The Apostle Paul had to talk about that. And unfortunately, over these many centuries, and I should say 2,000 years of church history, this subject has caused, I would say, many divisions. Uh, it has caused controversies. It has caused many, many hours of study, like we are doing now. Uh, it has caused, or rather it has given rise to volumes of books being written on this, articles being written, and even denominations being created. <laughs> this subject has caused, uh, you know, fellowships to split, denominations to split, new denominations come. For example, the Seventh-day Adventist is specifically because of the so-called Ten Commandments and the controversy over the Ten Commandments, right? There is Church of God Seventh-day. 
That's another denomination. And in fact, Worldwide Church of God was an offshoot of the Church of God Seventh Day. Right? Uh, so this particular subject has caused many, many uh, hours and hours of discussion and controversy and debates. And, and so here I am uh, sitting here to deal with this particular topic. What are Christians supposed to obey today? Um, and I would like to mention to you that I am here to sort out 2,000 years of dispute. Do you believe that? <laughs> I, hope you, I hope you don't believe that because 2,000 years of uh, you know, controversy and debates, I cannot put to rest in 45 minutes. <laughs> so all I'm going to do is, all I'm attempting here is, hope to bring one more dimension to the discussion, right? One more uh, perspective, hoping that there will be a little bit more clarity. Uh, I don't presume and I'm not foolish enough to think that I'm going to sort this problem out, you know, in the next uh, whatever minutes that we have. And in fact, I must say that I might take two, one, uh, one session for this, right? Okay, so having said that, um, like I said, I was delving into the subject I was looking at it from my perspective, reading scripture and all of that. And as I was writing my notes, I began to realize, man, these notes are going into pages and into pages. Uh, and I thought to myself, I really can't do justice to this topic in one Bible, in one sitting. So uh, if I may mention it to Pastor Sachin and uh, Pastor Praveen that I may need to continue this. And whenever you feel I need to continue, you can give me a slot. But I want to hopefully lay a groundwork, a foundation for us to start this discussion. Okay. So once again, the topic is, uh, as I have titled it, are Christians required to obey the Ten Commandments? All right. Now, what do people say about the Ten Commandments? Some say, there are people who say, it is the moral law that was given to the nation of Israel. It is separate from the ceremonial law because the things that followed the Ten Commandments became ceremonial. But there also there is a dispute. Is this the moral? There is, is there no morality in the ceremonial law? Is there no ceremony in the Ten Commandments? So there is still a discussion you know, that keeps on raging. <coughs> Some say that it existed from the beginning of creation, that all the Ten Commandments existed from the beginning of creation. That is how some people would like to conclude. There are others who believe that Jesus Christ summarized these ten into love God and love neighbor. Right? So they believe that since Jesus summarized this into love God and love neighbor, he validated the Ten Commandments. That is how some would like to uh, believe. There are others who believe that only, and there are many evangelicals who come into this, uh, only nine are applicable for Christians today. <laughs> and you know which one is not, <laughs> which one they say is not applicable, right? The big fourth commandment, right? So only nine is applicable. But of course, many, especially the Seventh-day Adventists, the Church of God, Seventh-day, and until recently, the Worldwide Church of God said, no, all ten are applicable. I was just looking at this aspect of, you know, how many are applicable. And there is a poll taken in England, and the Britishers believe that only six are relevant. Now, for what reason, I don't know, but they believe that only six really need, and the, the rest you can throw out. Right. Uh, there are some very respected Christians, uh, you know, big, big names in the evangelical world, people who are TV evangelists. And I heard one very respected man say, 
he quotes Romans 7 by saying Christians are not under the law. So he concludes that we are not hence under the Ten Commandments. So, uh, so these are various conclusions people make with regards to the Ten Commandments. There are those who believe that the Ten Commandments are not enough. We need more laws. Uh, you know, we need to add laws to the Ten Commandments. So this is not enough for the Christians. And so the controversy goes. On. And here we are discussing this controversy today. All right. Now, in my in my study on grace, I, I presume a few uh, weeks back. Uh, let me just now okay. lay down some, some basic perspectives that I hope we have agreed on. And so I hearken back to my uh, study on grace where we concluded through the discussions that Christians are not anti-law or if you can use a Greek word for that, antinomian, without law. We concluded that Christians today cannot say that they don't, that they <coughs> are under any law. For example, I mean, no matter which country we live in, we have to follow the constitution of the country. That is a law, supreme law laid down in any, any particular country. Or, for example, if you, uh, if you ride a motorcycle on the roads or if you drive a car on the roads, you have to obey the traffic laws. So you immediately come under the traffic laws, right? So um, the conclusion that we've made is that, that Christians, or I should say the Bible, uh, definitely does not say that we are anti-law, that God's people do not believe in any standard, right? We have concluded that Christians have an obligation to live in accordance to, now, what is the word to use? Law, should we say? Now, when we say law, sometimes it becomes a little confusing. Some people might not like that word. There are certain standards. Christians are obligated to live by certain principles, certain guidelines, certain rules. If I can use another biblical word, certain statutes, right? which is also used in the legal world. Certain essentials. Right? Principles, or I already mentioned principles, directives, ordinances, that's another biblical word. So Christians cannot say, and the Bible does not say that we have no obligations just because we are under grace. Once again, I'm referring back to my study on grace. Being under grace does not mean we live a so-called sinful lifestyle. We don't you know, uh, adopt a sinful lifestyle just because we are under grace. That is foolish, right? In fact, we have read as the Paul, the apostle writes to, the, to Timothy, or I think it was Titus, he, he says that being under grace is to say no to sin. In other words, grace, being under grace has an obligation. You have to have a certain uh, perspective in way the way you live and represent our Savior, Lord Jesus, being a witness for Him. So we have we we cannot say we are not under any law. In fact, can anybody live without law? For example, <laughs> can we say, "Oh, I'm under grace, so I don't have to follow the law of gravity"? <laughs> Can we say that? Uh, can you live without the law of gravity? The law of gravity is so, I mean to say, so natural that you naturally follow that law, right? Even atheists, those who do not believe in God, who deny the existence of God, live with certain sense of standards, with certain sense of principles. In fact, they believe that murder is wrong. Atheists will say murder is wrong, right? And of course, the question we want to ask them is, where? how do you understand that murder is wrong? And we'll come to that a little later. So, um, having said that, 
we have a standard. We have a obligation as disciples, as witnesses for Jesus Christ. So being under grace is not, it does not mean that we are antinomian, that we are without law. But here is once again that million dollar question. What is the standard? What is the so-called standard we are supposed to live with? And there, many would like to say, the big 10 C, <laughs> the 10 commandments, that is the standard, right? Um, and let me then deal with a few thoughts on that. Should the 10 commandments be the standard for Christians? Is that the final standard for Christians? That is the big controversy that keeps raging from time to time. All right. One of the reasons why many people say that is because they say sin is the transgression of the law. Right. They say sin is the transgression of the law. And the law immediately for them is 10 C. Right. The Ten Commandments. That's why they say that, uh, oh, the Ten Commandments is the standard. But there is a problem if we say that, right? And what is the problem? And for that, let me just bring up on the screen, and I'm going to go from my screen and to take it off, and then we come back and discuss. Let me just bring up some scriptures on the screen here. Okay. All right. Right. The... The uh, title for my subject. Uh, look at these two scriptures I'd like you to notice. Notice it says in, in James chapter 4, 17. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good, I'm using the good old King James Version, and doeth, not, doeth it not, to him it is sin. Now, the, if we say the Ten Commandments are the standard, and that is the law, that we must not transgress. But what is James saying? James is saying, those who know what is good and does not do it, it becomes sin. This is not covered in the Ten Commandments. It doesn't say thou shalt do good. There is no commandment like that. So in other words, if we say the Ten Commandments are the standard, then there is a problem. Notice in Galatians chapter 5, verse 19, I'm reading from the screen. Now, the works of the flesh, and I put in brackets, referring to things we must not do. When, when the apostle says works of the flesh, what he means is these things you must avoid. These are sinful, in other words. All right. And what are the works of the flesh? He says they are evident. Okay. Sexual Im immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry. And you might say, yes, those are all in the Ten Commandments. Good. They are in the Ten Commandments. Now, read further. In, uh, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, pits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy. Uh, uh, envy is already mentioned. Drunkenness, orgies. Are these mentioned in the Ten Commandments? <laughs> right? And things like, and notice he doesn't stop there. The apostle goes on to say, and things like these, that means there are more to the list. And then to the end of the verse, shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Okay? So, if we say, the Ten Commandments is the standard. Well, then we have a problem. What do we do with all of these things? Enmity? There is no commandment that says, Thou shalt not be an enemy. Thou shalt not have strife. Thou shalt not be jealous. Thou shalt not uh, be angry. Thou shalt not have rivalries. Where, where, where is the Ten Commandments say all these things? So there is a problem. Uh, the apostle here is 
very categorical by saying that these are behaviors that bars people from the kingdom of God. Such shall not inherit the kingdom of God. In other words, the standards for Christians are much more than transgressing, so-called transgressing the law. Sin is defined as more than transgressing the law. All right. So I'm just posing a problem here. I'm, I'm just helping us to understand that uh, the way people like the Apostle Paul understood the standard for Christian behavior is not just the Ten Commandments. It goes much beyond the Ten. Okay. Uh, so I come back to the question. What is the standard for Christians? All right? What is the standard for Christians? If the Apostle Paul uh, enhances the ten and says there are so many things more, then the question is, what is the standard for Christians? To answer that question, like I was, like I was uh, telling you a little earlier, as I was trying to, uh, you know, study this, man, I started. So many thoughts started coming into my mind as I was reading some of our literature, uh, you know, some material that I've had. I feel this question is not simplistic. I cannot say yes or no at the moment. <laughs> I have to lay a foundation. I have to lay the ground before we can really come to answer the question, what is the standard for Christians today? And that's the reason why I feel I would be shortchanging you. I will not do justice to the subject if I just launch into some few scriptures and say, and here is the answer. No, I need to lay a groundwork. And that's the reason why I feel I would probably need more than this study. Uh, probably at least one more for me to be able to bring some, make some sense of this uh, from the scriptures. So having said that, I feel we need to take a bigger approach, right? Uh, a different approach. And by that, I mean to say that we need to go to the very beginning. We need to find out the fundamental points before we try to answer the question, are the Ten Commandments the standard for Christians today? When I say fundamental points, what I mean is what is God's intention for humanity in the first place? Why did he create us? Did he create us just for laws? Did he create us so that he can have a legal relationship with us? You know, we need to understand what are the covenants? What is a covenant? And what was added to the covenant? We need to understand what is God's promise for humanity uh, when he created us. And then it talks about the laws were added to covenant. What does that mean? So unless we recognize all of this, I don't think we can fairly answer the question about, uh, you know, uh, what is the standard for Christians today? In other words, we need to recognize the very purpose that God created us for. And so what I'm trying to going to do is I'm, <laughs> I'm going to take you along a road uh, with some you know, basic fundamental aspects of uh, our, our of our biblical faith. I am hoping that this road is not going to be winding. It might be a little winding. You know, I'm going to take you through twists and turns. And please don't get lost. <laughs> if you get lost, uh, try to, you know, help me and I'll come back and, uh, you know, pose some questions or maybe I, I'll give you a chance to answer uh, ask some questions. So, uh, and please bear with me. I may be just a little, uh, I'm, I don't know, I may be repetitive. Uh, I may say some things that, uh, you know, may go off the track a little bit. But in my understanding, I feel those are all necessary. So, uh, fasten your seatbelt. Uh, let's go for the ride. Okay. <laughs> Remember, I asked, the per I asked the question, what is the purpose God had in mind when he created humans? I feel we need to answer that question first before coming to the big 10C question. All right. To answer that question in a very 
in a very short manner. Once again, you know, there are so many scriptures I can bring, but one scripture I feel nails it on the head, even though you can bring in many other scriptures and add many more things. But one scripture nails it on the head in terms of what is the purpose that God created human beings for? And for that, I want to read this scripture and let me bring it up on the screen here. Uh, I hope you can see my screen. Uh, the scripture I want to bring up is Ephesians uh, sorry, uh, yeah, Ephesians chapter 1, beginning in to read from verse 4. Notice now, God, uh, the apostle says to us, as he writes to the church in Ephesus, for he chose us, you could say, he brought us into existence and chose us in him, that is in Christ, before the creation of the world. I just want to keep pausing for a moment and just, uh, I want you to just reflect on those words. Notice before the creation of the, because this was what, in, what was in his mind, God's mind, before he created us. Why did he choose us? Why did he bring us into existence? Why? Notice it says, for he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, verse 5, he predicted or rather he predestined us to sonship or rather to adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. Going on to complete uh, that thought, verse 6, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. I'd like you to notice uh, especially those highlighted words in this uh, scripture. In love, he predestined us. In other words, he pre-thought what he was going to do with the creation. What is he going to do with these human beings that he's created? He pre-thought, he predestined us for adoption to sonship, of course, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. All right. I want to take a moment to just expand on that. You know? Biblically, what we understand from that is that God created humanity and, of course, you know, creation and humanity in particular to bring us ultimately into a relationship. And this is something we have been saying time and time again, all our Pastors have been talking about it, but it's very important for me to reiterate that because we need to understand what is the very purpose for our existence. So he uh, wants a relationship with us. What is the kind of relationship with us? A adoption into sonship. He wants to have a communion with us where God and humans dwell together in harmony, enjoying his love. For us. In other words, God created us to bless us and to bring us into communion with Himself. Let me contrast that by saying God did not want to have a legal relationship with us. He was not making a legal situation with us like most other philosophies would talk about. That God is there and then he gives us laws and that we just obey and then he sits in his place. No, God wants to have a familial relationship with us, adoption into sonship. He wants us, he wants us to be his children and we his father. It is a familial relationship. Um, it is not a contractual relationship. He wants a covenantal relationship with us, right? Father-son relationship, right? Uh, there is, uh, if, you, if you look at our own lives, in our families, uh, our relationship is different from a legal relationship, you know? Father and son does not have a contract. When the son was born, the father didn't make a contract with the child and say, you know, now you are my child and I am your father and you shall obey this. And No, that was not what God had in mind. right? So the purpose of God is to bring us into communion, into a relationship. And it is a familial relationship, not a contractual or 
a legal relationship. For us to be able to fulfill, for us to be able to enjoy that relationship that God had in mind, we need to have compatibility. God and humans must have compatibility, right? We cannot remain unholy while he remains holy. You see, notice the, 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 the scripture said that that, uh, uh, that he chose us for us to be holy and blameless. In other words, that sense of holiness and blamelessness is necessary is for compatibility between him and us because he's holy. He wants us to be holy, right? We cannot enjoy communion with God while not having faith in him, not believing in him. Not trusting him. We cannot live in hatred while God is a God of love. We cannot continue to be harbor hatred in us while God continues to love us. We cannot enjoy his love if we continue to spew venom and hatred towards one another. You cannot have that attitude in you to be able to fulfill that relational goal that God created us for. So, creation itself is proclaiming that we have to have a standard to live with. The fact that we were brought into, create, in, into, into, into existence and then to have communion with God, we must have a standard. Right? So, the very purpose or the goal of creation is that God is promising us to bring us into communion with him. He wants us to inherit, you know, uh, a relationship with him. And that is why he wants us to walk together with him. Remember the prophet says, two cannot walk together unless they are agreed. For this relationship to work, we must have a an agreement. We must have a Compatibility with God. For a relationship to blossom and mature with God, we have to we have to interact, we have to participate with God in His life. And we have to live a lifestyle that is compatible with God. So living by God's purpose uh means that we have a standard that we have to follow. Okay? Am I making sense? It's, uh, you know, almost 10 past 7. I, I want to make sure that you and I understand this, right? And, uh, do you, do you, are you able to see what I am trying to conclude with God's, what God's purpose is? If God has created us, and he has created us for himself. Do you recognize that they automatically has to have a standard we have to follow for us to fulfill that relational goal that God has? Any any thoughts or questions? I mean, uh, I, I'm I'm going to do this again and again. We'll come back and ask you some questions. Let's let's uh, bring in some discussion at the moment. I've not yet finished, but <laughs> go ahead. Yes, Mr. Rao. Yeah, I think, uh, did you did you understand what I'm trying to say? Yes, sir. I'm able to understand. No. <clears throat> what to say? You say uh, there has to be some standard. Right. Okay. And you say that the Ten Commandments are not that standard. You have to have more than that. Okay. What I want to say is... Yeah. What you say that some other extra... I mean, other than Ten Commandments, I feel that those are included in Ten Commandments. <laughs> that is extension of Ten Commandments. Even though it is not mentioned in the Ten Commandments... Okay. It is the extension. It is... Same thing. See, anger, uh, all these things, 
it is also a good conduct of the man. I feel that way. Yeah. Mr. Rao, can I ask you a question? Yeah. With just the Ten Commandments, can you say anger is sinful? Hmm? With just the Ten Commandments, hmm. don't take anything else, just the Ten Commandments, can you say anger is sinful? See, that is included in the Ten Commandments, sir. I'm sorry, I, I, can't I can't see it at all. Why should I be, why should you say I'm sinful if I get angry? I didn't kill if anybody. If you are angry, ah. you, you may hurt somebody. See, you are already taking what is concluded in the New Testament. Don't do that. Please don't do that. Jesus already said mm. that anger is the source of murder, right? He already mm. said that. Now, yeah. you are taking that. But mm. if I didn't have Jesus, if Jesus never said that, if I only had Moses and the Ten Commandments, do you think anger is sinful according to the Ten Commandments? Uh, <laughs> that is, you're talking like a good judge. See, <laughs> if, if you are, if you believe, if you believe Christ as your savior, um, you have to live a holy life. Yeah. That's what you recently said. Very well. The what is holiness, actually? What is holiness? Not you doing bad things. Is it in the Ten Commandments? Even though it is not said, but it means that, see, if you just take literal that numbers or that wordings, I don't think that is enough. That's exactly what I said. And you are saying mm. that all the other things are included in the 10. No, sorry, that is not correct. The 10 is actually only a part of the bigger standard. Yeah. Ah, now that, that, is good. that extra many things are good. That is what Christians should live that way. But it that is, is not part of the Ten Commandments. No, sir. Well, I, 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 I mean, I'm reading plain English. Anybody else like to contribute to that? Or maybe I'm not explaining it correctly. <laughs> sir, can I please come in, sir? Please yeah. come in. Please. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, sir, can you hear me, sir? I can hear oh, you. Go ahead. Oh, uh, sir, I think the Ten Commandments, no, sir, uh, restricts its meaning to the breaking of the phys a physical law. Okay. It doesn't. Uh, it doesn't talk about the spirit of the law, sir. Today we draw a distinction between breaking the letter of the law and the spirit of the law. When yes. Christ expanded that, uh, you shall not be angry, or when he says, "Whosoever harbors anger in his heart is already a sinner," Christ was talking about the spirit behind the law. Yeah. Now, now, Franklin, if you will uh, listen to yourself, you are talking about the spirit of the law. Now, where did you learn that from? From the New Testament, sir. <laughs> from the New Testament. Expansion. Not from the Ten Commandments. Yes, sir. Ah, yes, sir. Yes, please, yes, sir. please accept that. It is not in the Ten Commandments. The Spirit yes, sir. I, I, later. <laughs> yes, sir. I agree, sir. I agree with you. Yes. The, the Ten Commandments restricts its meaning and explanation to the breaking of the letter of the law, but Absolute. not the spirit of the law. Absolutely. Yes. So that means uh, you need not to keep the law, Ten Commandments? Nobody said that. You are saying same that way and this way also, sir. No, sorry. Please listen to me carefully. Yeah, complete your... Uh, your um... my, my question is, is Ten Commandments the standard? I did not say yes or no, to keep it or not keep it. I said, is that the standard? I think Sachin has a thought. Go ahead, Sachin. I think... Uh... A human interpretation of law is to the word uh, because that's how we grow up uh, hearing in the court cases and everywhere. We go up right up to the uh, each word what it means, right? So as you rightly ask, does, does these are the only thing or I feel these are just the standards and the stand, level of standard goes much beyond 
uh, what it is. But yes, Rajiv Uncle, when um, when Pastor Dan asked, I think when it comes to law, we have to go by the word. Uh, not here or not there, not interpretation of it, if it doesn't say so. Uh, to to I mean, on the educational level, if you want to compare. So in, in that sense, yes, you are right. Uh, it is not there. And they are standards. And I think we'll have to wait for how the conclusion comes <laughs> to get yeah. an answer. Okay, thank you very much, Sachin. Yeah, that's a that's a interesting thought uh, that you added. I don't know if uh, Suryamurthy, did you want to say something? No. Okay, okay. I thought you had unmuted yourself. All right. Let me just then continue for a few more moments, and then uh, once again, like I said, I'll <laughs> this discussion will go on for a while. So please uh, bear with me on that. All right. So um, I I I was able to hopefully able to explain what is the purpose, right? They are going, they're asking the big question. What is the purpose God created us for? We concluded that through the scripture in Ephesians that God created us for communion. And for, for us to have communion, we must have a, uh, you could say a response, a participation, a standard by which we participate with God. Uh, if we have to identify with God, we need to be able to, uh, you know, um, see with look at him with you know eye to eye uh, we may we must be agreed in certain ways so we 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 understood that so they uh, uh you know uh, that is something that we need to keep in mind so how did god then proceed okay adam and eve so i want to go to adam and eve now he started with adam and eve now remember creation was an act of grace we must recognize that god did not need to create us he was not needy for him to create us so that he was so lonely he wanted some company. No. It was his sheer love which he wanted to share. He was already complete in himself as Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And to be able to share his love, to let that love overflow, creation came into existence. All right? Um, so by creating... Creation itself is a promise that God was wanting to have a special relationship with his creatures, right? And uh, he was promising them that he is going to have them to be part of his family, right? Now, that was his promise. Creation itself shows it's a promise. But promise calls for a response, when somebody promises something, it calls for a response, a response of faith, right? Adam and Eve were created and God started interacting with them and he wanted them closer and closer and closer. He walked with them in the garden and he wanted to have that relationship, but they had to respond. They had to respond in belief that God created them for having this relationship with them that God was good in doing that, that God was wanting the best for them, and hence he wanted them to put his faith, their faith in him. He, God, I mean to say, Adam and Eve needed to believe that God did not create humanity for condemnation or for destruction. So Adam had, Adam and Eve had to recognize that they were created and now, to enjoy the love of God, they had to respond to that love of God, right? What was that standard with which they had to respond? What was the standard with which they would enjoy the promise of God? First and foremost, it was belief. They had to believe God. And once they believed God, they had to trust him. They had to trust him that God is good and he has created us for something good. Then they, they had to have faith in him. Notice what the words I'm using. Belief, trust, faith, they are more or less synonymous. But it follows one after another. When you have belief in God, you start trusting God. And you start moving closer to God. And when you put faith in him, even though you sometimes don't know something, you still trust God and you, you still will move, continue to move closer to him. 
That way, they start living in the covenant promise, right? For them to live within God's promised covenant of having them become their children, they have to have that belief, trust, and faith. You see, it is implied that the response must be according to a that particular standard. It begins with belief, trust, and faith. Might I say at this moment, there is no, of course, <laughs> I'm, I'm arguing from, you know, uh, uh, absence of information. Might I just say that there was no 10 commandments given to Adam and Eve. Right? But there was a standard. But there was a standard. They had to respond. Right? Now, what was that standard? It is not specified in the in the in the in the first few chapters of Genesis. But from deducting what is available, I can say this much. Notice God created him in his image. Right? In the image of God created male and female. In other words, right there, we have a standard. What is the standard? We are images of God. We were intended to represent him in creation. To be able to represent God, we must live a certain way to be true to his nature. To be true to God's character. So the image of God is a standard by itself. The fact that he created us with faculties of mind and thinking and emotion, decision making, the freedom of thinking, right there, God was showing us that there was a standard. We had to be images. We had to represent him. Okay? Secondly, What is the most essential character of that image of God? What is the most essential character of the, of the image of God? In other words, who is God? <laughs> you probably heard that question many, many, many a times. Who is this God? What is, what is the most essential aspect of the image of God? For that, we need to go before creation. And shall we go before creation? And I want to show you a scripture here very quickly. Let me show you this. Uh, who is this God before creation? Okay, this was what we read earlier. Okay. John 17 verse 24 notice. Jesus in his prayer says, Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because, pay attention, you loved me before the creation of the world. You loved me before the creation of the world. Love was an essential aspect of who God is. There was love before the creation of the world. Love didn't come with, with humanity. Love, came, love existed pre-humanity, pre-creation. All right? What was the standard with which God lived? What was the standard with which God existed? May I say tongue-in-cheek, it was not the Ten Commandments. <laughs> there were no Ten Commandments between God, a father and son. Uh, what is love? You know, we get confused when we talk about love. You know, we use love in so many uh, ways that uh, uh, that sometimes it confuses. For example, we say, I love biryani. If you ask Franklin Poppins, he'll say, I love masala dosa from Taj Mahal Hotel. <laughs> yes, sir. This morning we went, sir. We went and came. <laughs> but in the same vein, we say we love, I love my wife, I love my child, I love my son, I love. 
you know, uh, sometimes it gets confusing. You love biryani and you still love your life. Is it the same? It's certainly not the same. You see, what we have to understand is love is not just a feeling. It's a behavior. It is an action. Right? Yes, emotions and feelings accompany it. That's the reason why in the New Testament, they did not use the same word for love that God had. We use the word agape. There is philia and there is a few other words, but agape. That shows the kind of love that existed in, you know, in, in with God. Because of this love, now, <coughs> let me just shop say. Because of this love, this essential, very fundamental aspect of God's essential nature, they could be in communion. Father, Son could be in communion. Father, Son, Holy Spirit could live in harmony. They live in trust. They live in faith. They live in belief. The essential, the essential standard was love. And if I can just say, and I'm going to conclude with this, when love is present, the apostle says, you don't need a law. You don't need a law. Unfortunately, my time is up. Uh, and I didn't even get through one third of my presentation. I don't know how I'm going to finish this, but... <laughs> Two, three seconds, sir. I'm going to stop there. Uh, but uh, we'll just take a minute or two if there's any, any thoughts that you'd like to echo at this moment. Can I come in? Please come, uh, Bertie, go ahead. Yeah. I think I'll take... Uh... Uh, um, Mr. Sanjeeva Rao's <laughs> side, and but Mr. Rao, Sanjeeva Rao, don't get too excited because <laughs> okay, okay, go ahead. Because in John it says that the Lord said, "If you love me, you will keep my commandments." Yeah. But uh, don't don't jump out of your chair, Mr. Uh, Sanjeeva Rao, because uh, Ms. Zakaria needs to <laughs> expound that. What does Christ mean by uh, "If you love me"? you will abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love just as I kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. Uh, uh, yes, that was a great moral law. Uh, uh, God wants to write that law in our heart. But I think Mr. Zakaria, uh, you know, in subsequent uh, Bible studies should um, tell us more. And we know God is love. Christ gave us two great commandments. So, you know, Maybe, Ms. Zakra, you need to expound that more. Or oh, Pastor Sachin, you may need to expound that more. Where Jesus Christ gave two great commandments. And they say, if you if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. All that. But you need to expound that, Ms. Zakra. Okay. Well, I'll try my best. And yes, uh, the whole co concept of commandments and the law. Uh, yeah, there's a lot to talk, talk about. Yeah. But uh, I hope... I've been able to at least help you recognize at least that there is a standard by which we live. There is not, uh, don't ever say that we Christians have no standard to live with, you know, uh, or, or those who believe in grace should have never say that, oh, I can do anything I want. No, that's ridiculous. That doesn't come at all. So, uh, Pastor Dan, uh, first, uh, we must continue this subject next week also. Uh, you have a liberty, uh, and when the time permits for you to continue with this subject, um, it has been very helpful. And just to, to summarize my understanding to it is, uh, today you have shared that um, God has given um, Christians live on a standard, uh, we have a standard. We are not lawless per se. Correct? Number one. Number two, uh, when you talked about uh, the Ten Commandments, they were the standards, but by no means they are the only standards with which Christians live. And then you gave uh, from James this thing that it goes, and Ephesians where Apostle Paul broadens the horizon of the standards with which we should be. Uh, then you took us to the foundation of the standard that is love. Uh, love that existed between uh, Father, Son and the Holy Spirit. 
and in that likeness we are created to respond to that love in yeah. union and communion in which you have shared uh, adam and eve had belief trust and faith uh, of course uh, out of love all these three and that formed their standard of living correct yeah absolutely excellent yeah. <laughs> so up to there we have come and we really look forward to see how it ends but yes one the point that i took take it is that uh, we have far more uh, stringent standards to live because we are created for different purpose and we are created in his image you know so that that puts a lot of um, expectation from us in terms of standards so yes we are not lawless that's yes. it thank yeah. you Thank you, Sachin. Very well summarized. And if I can just add to that, you know, uh, keep that in mind. We are images of God. We are representing God. And how do you represent God? And that's a very important question that we have to go back time and time again. Uh, okay, sorry, we went a little over time. Yeah, Shanti, you had a thought? Go ahead. Yeah, so uh, for me, uh, the takeaway for, uh, for today was, um, I mean, we've known this but just sometimes some things that we know also we don't put it at the forefront right so for me this this is what i'm going to take for it to the forefront that adam uh abraham uh isaac and all these people who came before the 10 commandments were given they did not have the 10 commandments <laughs> it was not with them but they had a certain standard to live by. That is loving God in the way that he has uh, given his instructions according to his instructions. At that point of time, however, they've been given. Now, to Abraham, he didn't go and say, do not lie. He didn't go and specify a few things that are there, you know, in the typical way in the Ten Commandments say. He didn't take, give those instructions to people who came before Moses. But nevertheless, because of their realization of who the Almighty God is, of how holy He is, so automatically when we grow closer to this holy God, we tend to be holy like Him, isn't it? When we put our trust in Him, when we understand His holy concepts, it automatically comes into that. And so He might not, you know, uh, in the Old Testament, um, like, in, like you said, the standards are different. But in the New Testament, I take it as this, that the standard was Jesus also for me. When we look at him, he becomes the standard in the New Testament. He might not have told in these English terminology, I command thee, do this. But he has said many things and he said, follow me. And so many of the things that was his life, it becomes a standard. And so automatically it becomes a standard for us to be in such a way. Whether the Ten Commandments, you want to, we want to be, you know, what do you call, legalistically say that, yes, we have to follow this or not. But yet Jesus is our standard. And so all the things that he says, listen to me, do this as you, you would have done it for me. You know, all of these things that he says, all these come under his commandments, come under his way of living and his instructions. And so for me, I take it as that. And so thank you for bringing that again to the forefront. Yes. Thank you. Yes. And, uh, you know, I mean, like you said, uh, there is a automatic or you could say a natural, what you call this awareness as human beings, we are creating the natural awareness that there are something that are right and there is something that are wrong. Why? Because we are images. We are made in his image. There is a natural understanding. Even atheists, like I said, know that murder is wrong. Non-Christians know it is wrong. What is so great about the Ten Commandments? That even the, even the non-pagans you know, pagans know that it is wrong. But there is something that we are missing by, by uh, not recognizing you know, the, the, the fundamental purpose and perspective of where these things all come from. So we'll, we'll, we'll carry on. Thank you. <laughs> sir, can I just uh, make a few comments, sir? Uh, go ahead, Franklin. We are uh, over time. Sir, but I, I would like to give the first opportunity to Mr. Rao, sir, his favorite subject. Mr. Rao, you have anything to say? <laughs> let me come, uh, let me hear uh, what, what is going, what is going to say. Then yes. I will come. 
Okay, sir. Uh, I, sir, I want to submit two quick points, sir. Mm. Make it quick. <laughs> Uh, sir, the, the first one was, sir, in the past, we, we taught our congregation, sir, the Ten Commandments were in vogue from day one, from the time of Adam. Uh, yes. That is why, sir, uh, we were brought to the notice. Uh, uh, God confronted, uh, who's that, sir? Cain. He said, if you do well, you will, why, why will you not be accepted? Sin lieth at the door. The definition right. of sin is was given way before it was codified and given at Moses. Yeah. Okay, sir. Now, my, my second final point, sir. Yeah. Uh, you touched about uh, love, no, sir? Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. This is a unique Christian doctrine, sir. There are only three worldviews, three monotheistic worldviews, Judaism, Islam, and Christianity. Christianity is the only religion, sir, which teaches love because God is a trinity. Okay. Yeah. What is love? Yeah. Okay, we'll come to that. I think uh, uh, we have uh, <laughs> we have covered a fair bit today, but uh, there's ways to go. Thank you very much. And uh, sir, 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 one last question for you, sir. One last question: Are yes. the Ten Commandments a spiritual law, sir? Okay, we'll come to those things. You know, I mean, uh, let's come to the law in a while. If Bertie, you are still there, can I request you to close in prayer? Yes, let's bow our heads. Uh, Father God, we just thank you for this time together as your people, your children, Lord, whom you love and care and you have blessed us with this understanding. You have used your servant, Pastor Zechariah, Lord, to teach us and to open understanding. Lord, uh, while we can have a uh, lot different uh, uh, sort of misunderstandings or Lord, not understanding it uh, uh, properly, do help us, Lord, to know that we are your children, Lord, made in your image and likeness, and that we have your nature in us, that is by we have accepted Christ, Lord. He is everything to us, Lord. We have to follow him. And Lord, he is writing his laws on our hearts and minds, the law of love. Teach us, Lord, to be faithful and truthful to your word. And Lord, bless us with your peace and joy. And Lord, um, help us in our, in our uh, sojournment on the earth. Help us, Lord, to be example. Since we accept the light through Jesus Christ, we also become lights. Thank you for this time, Lord. We are blessed with this time. Bless the people who have attended, Lord, they and their families, and also who are all others who could not. Please bring them for the Bible study so they also may grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We thank you, Father, again, and bless us with a proper sleep, rest, Lord, which you have already given us, Lord, spiritually help us to, Lord, grow in this love. Help us to identify with you. Look to you, Lord, and not, uh, Lord, stray. Blessed be your name, Lord. Blessed, blessed be the triune. Great glory and honor belong to the triune God who has purpose and will bring everything to fruition, Lord, according to your plan and purposes. Thank you for this time together. We pray this prayer in the blessed and glorious name of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.